The Still Learning Podcast is brought to you by the wonderful people on Patreon. Amazing people like Ryan K, Eric H, Matt, aka Stormageddon, Kevin from the Bit by Bit Foundation, Gilmer, Stephen P, and Mr. Biscuits have all been wonderful enough to support the show over there. So if you would also like to get your name read at the beginning of an episode, along with a bunch of other goodies, go over to patreon.com slash stillloadingpod and check out everything it has to offer. On this episode of Still Loading, the most Nomura asks, wait, what do you mean he didn't direct this one? Hello, everyone. Welcome to this new episode of the Still Loading Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Koval. On today's episode, it is the finale of Backlog Month. Uh, we have covered four different games, all voted on by you, the well, by my wonderful patrons, whom, whom I'm assuming are listening to this. Did I use whom correctly? I don't know. As Even though I speak English, I don't fucking understand the grammar of it. Anyway, we're here to talk about the last game for uh backlog month and joining me to talk about dirge of cerberus final fantasy 7 joining me to discuss this very interesting game is my good buddy mick aka mick arcade mick how are you doing today i am fantastic ready to talk about this nonsensical game this game is like a nomura fever dream and i beat it and I'm like, okay, man, Nomura really just, they they got to stop giving this man the reins to for the thing. <laughs> Looked who directed it, and he just was the character designer. He didn't even yep. fucking direct it. It was <laughs> Takayoshi Nakazato, uh, and Kitase was the producer once again. The, the, the writer, did they give the writer? Hiroki Chiba was the writer for the game. And man, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I know Katase's credits obviously pretty well because he's done all like he's Final Fantasy, you know, he, yeah. he's wor- he's been he's he worked on Final Fantasy Adventure as early as Final Fantasy Adventure and has done games all the way up to present, which he's the producer of Rebirth. So, you know, like he's been he, he's still in the series. He's still like he's just Final Fantasy and a little bit of Kingdom Hearts and all that other stuff. So like. Oh, there's a game called Sigma Harmonics that I've never even heard of before. It came out for the DS. That's got to be like a, a music rhythm game or something. Never came out in North America. That's why we never heard about it. Yep. Um. Yeah, uh, it is just a it's a role playing game. So I don't I don't know. The, the art's huh. really cool. Anyway, uh, that's neither here nor there. So, yeah, I when I was looking through it, though, I was just fucking confused to see that this was not directed by Nomura because the amount of bullshittery in the terms of story and random cheesy dialogues and fucking proper nouns that was like this would sound cool to someone in the 12th grade uh, yeah it, it's <laughs> not 12th grade to, to a 12 year old excuse me I can't yeah even no it's it, you know what this game is it's mm. anime junk food. That's yes. what it is. There's no nutritional value here. You know you shouldn't eat it because it's not good for you, but you just can't <laughs> stop. And you just keep going and you don't know why. And I mean, I you know, because from a gameplay perspective, I think it's a blast. Like it's a fun game. You know, it's, it's fairly simple and straightforward. Um, Kind of in, in that sort of like Devil May Cry way of like, you just get in kind of like a the zone when it comes to combat. Mm-hmm. But the story is just like, what? <laughs> it just gets weirder and crazier and more out there. And I don't know. My favorite bit is, is the names of, of the, the, you know, the villains, the bosses like that. That's my favorite. Cause it's so ridiculous. <laughs> just like, why, why did you do this? There is just so much just, like I, it, it <laughs> anime junk food is the perfect description. I don't think you could describe it any better than that. And I don't think I like the gameplay quite as much as you, 
but we'll we'll get into more of that as we as we go through it. Um, but yeah, I guess we can we can just start off with then personal experiences. You know, like what? So you know, I, I put out the call for you know these are the four games that I have for backlog month. Who would be interested in coming on for some of these? And I forget how exact. I think because I mentioned Dirge of Cerberus one or when it was on the poll, I think you commented on it talking about how much you liked it. Like, oh, yeah. well, if it wins, I guess I'll have to invite Mick on. So what about <laughs> Dirge of Cerberus? Like, how did you first experience it and what kind of drew you to the game, I guess? So, I mean, of course, you know, it is a, a sequel to um, Final Fantasy um, 7. It, in it's story it's, only. Yeah, it's story only. Like, that. that's kind of where it ends. You know, there's there's some of the same characters from Final Fantasy 7. And, and Final Fantasy 7 is one of my you know all-time favorite games i i always make the joke that i have a uh, a blood pact with that game because i have a final fantasy 7 tattoo so um and so that you know that's of course where it, it interested me and you know this came out the year i graduated high school and i want to say hmm. i think i went back and was playing final fantasy 7 uh, in the middle of my senior year just like randomly i was like you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna play play seven again you know so i'm just you know go to school come home to play final fantasy seven until i go to sleep get up go to school come home and just rinse repeat until i yeah didn't beat the game because i'm like no i have to get everything unlocked and perfected and master all the materials and i just kind of burn out towards the end of the game in that regard somewhere in the third disc but you know i heard about this game coming out I was like, oh, man, you get to play as Vincent. And like every, you know, 17, 18 year old, Vincent is the coolest. You know, he's a yeah. cool vampire man. He's got a cloak and a gun. And, you know, he's just he's just super cool. You know, so when I found out like, oh, Vincent's getting his own game, and it's a sequel to seven. I'm in because, um, you know, this is uh, if, if I remember correctly, this was when they did that. um really big push around yeah yeah it was the compilation of final fantasy 7 that's right so it, you're you're talking advent children you're talking mm. um the mobile game before crisis yep. uh you're talking about um the game with zach uh, uh geez uh, crisis core yeah crisis core i was like i i know it's somewhere around there but so you know it was that moment where they were like you know what let's just release a ton of final fantasy 7 adjacent stuff and see what sticks but uh yeah just everything about it drew me in because i was like yep this, this this looks awesome this looks cool uh and you know seeing like uh a tr I, you know i think i saw a trailer a game or a little bit of the gameplay and i said oh man this looks like devil may cry a little bit combat wise um which it's not really <laughs> like no it's, it's not yeah, yeah there's like a grading yeah. system but in terms of like how devil may cry especially the difficulty this game i'll get into it when we get to the gameplay i found really easy yeah it, it's it's super easy devil may cry not super easy this no is, fuck is that game pretty, <laughs> I, I love it but it's so hard especially the third game oh my god but anyway uh <laughs> so you know, that, that's what drew me in. I was just like, oh, it's action. And, you know, you get to play as Vincent and kind of like, I'm like, what are they going to do? Because you just they didn't really tell you much of the story. And yeah, so just everything about it. Th this was a game that I got when I pre-ordered it, you know, at at uh, EB Games. I, I ordered the strategy guide with it because that's just what you did. Uh, picked it up day one, played it, beat it in probably like two, three days. and. I was like, wow, that was such an awesome game. And then I played it again years later and I was like, huh, teenage me really had a low bar when it came to video games. Don't get me wrong. I really do enjoy this game. I think it's fun. Uh, the story is just it, it's it's so ridiculous that it, it's hilarious. But uh, I do love this game just because it I don't know. It's just it hit at that time in my life where it is exactly what I needed and exactly what I wanted. <laughs> I could totally understand that. I feel like that everyone has that piece of media that it it hits at the right place at the right time, and then you go back and you look at it later. You still love it. Like there's no unironic love. It's not an sorry. It's not an ironic love. It is a genuine unironic love of it. 
Um, but you can also acknowledge the ridiculousness and the stupidity of whatever it may be. You know, for for me, um, I'm trying to think of something around the same time. Like if I was a you know a senior in high school, like what was that thing for me? You know what? <laughs> in all honesty, I used to really be into Skillet, the band Skillet. I yep, I get, I I I completely understand. <laughs> and now I listen to their music and it's just a little too cheesy that and John Cooper kind of went off the deep end a little bit and uh, their their vocalist and bassist and I'm like ah, I can't really it's hard for me to listen to you now. And just that and the lyrics are just very very Christian cheesy. And I you know, I have it's no issue with Christian old, yeah. music, but it's very Christian cheesy. Yeah, no, I, I know exactly what you mean. And, and that's sort of where this game falls for me is that Christian cheesy. <laughs> that's where yeah, it no, falls. No, 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 it's just <laughs> it's just it's cheesy. And, and, and it's, it is. It, but and it, it takes it it's, takes itself so serious because, you know, Vincent is serious as a heart attack and, you know, doesn't have any sort of humor voice by Steve Bloom, him. too. Yeah, my my teacher. Yep. Yeah. Mr. Steve did, wait, Bloom. did Steve Bloom teach you? Mm hmm. Yep, that's where I uh, learned voice acting from. Was uh, Steve? That, like, I am a, sorry, yeah, go ahead. I'm I, I'm a Blumvox graduate because uh, he has his own. Uh, granted, I did mine. It, it's it's he does it differently now. It's changed a little bit over the years. Uh, but when I because I think now it's all pre recorded. Uh, but when I did it, it was actual like lives. It wasn't one on one. It wasn't just like me and Steve, you know, it was me and, you know, 20, 30 other people, whatever it is. Um, but when I did it, he taught live and, and you could ask questions and there was like feedback and he would give. And I think he still does the challenges, but, uh, you know, he would do challenges and and things like that. But yeah, he's he's he was my teacher uh, and he is an incredible guy. And Love why him. have you not hooked me up with an interview for the podcast with him? <laughs> Because I think gun to his head, Steve could not tell you who I am <laughs> because this was God, this was like 2018. I did this. I want to say 27 that long ago. It's only six uh, years. Yeah, it's hey, only six years. Hey, Steve, you, know. you remember me? Um, uh, yeah, no, he has no idea who I am. No, at all. Uh, but no, he is a great guy. I do. I yeah, like what I I have a, an autographed uh, Spike Spiegel photo from him that um, during COVID I got. But uh I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I was one of your students and blah, blah, blah. He's like, oh, yeah, really appreciate it. You know, always. <laughs> That's a really it. good Steve Bloom. I've heard Steve talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, he he's great. Um it's one of those that's like sort of the downside too of being a student of his in that setting because you want to ask him stuff like what was it like working on final fantasy 7 dirge of Cerberus? but you know you want to but you can't because it's just not that kind of like uh if i remember there was like a rule against like you know this uh, this is a a classroom setting not a, a situation where you you know could just it's not a convention like that's where those you know it, like he would talk about experiences on certain projects but yeah it wasn't like i got to be like what was it like being vincent you know because that would have been that would have been fun but no he's uh he's great and so many so much of the stuff i learned from him i still do to this day and I and I'll always, you know, do do a little Steve impression now and again. That's, that's really great. funny. Just that that's wonderful. Like that that's that's he says that a lot. <laughs> For my own experience with this game, uh it did not I had no Steve Bloom experience on this end. Um, but I bought this game when it was still contemporary. I actually bought it from Circuit City. They're going out of business sale. Oh, wow. What a time. Yeah. I picked this game up along with, uh, oh my gosh, what is it? Uh, I picked this game up along with uh, Final Fantasy XII from, that, from their going out of business sale. And I have not, still not played Twelve. And I only played Dirge of Cerberus recently, which was for this. That was I, I like I remember trying out the first level shortly after I got it, and then I never really got any further. And then I'm like, you know what? I need an excuse to beat this game. So I put it on my backlog month list, and here we are. You know, uh we all my patrons voted for it in January at the beginning of this year. And it's funny, like 
this game more than others took me the longest to beat. I beat my first the the, the three out of the four games. I beat them by I want to say March or April. And to put in perspective, listeners, we are recording this in September, and I beat Dirge of Cerberus maybe in August. So it really wasn't like it was there was a large gap between me beating the first three games for Backlog Month and this one. And part of that is uh, all the, the three other games I could either play on my Switch or I was able to play on my on while streaming. My PS2 is not hooked up to streaming because i i need like some type of hd upscaling for it which i can't i don't have uh i don't have a not a frame meister what is it the crap what's the new one that's from freaking uh oh shoot almost knocked my water over why am i blanking on the name of this it's not the ossc it is the son of a bitch i'm gonna have to look it up because it's gonna drive me nuts that i can't remember what it is but anyway so i I couldn't play it on stream so i would have to set aside time where i was not editing or streaming on my computer to actually plug in my my ps2 and my tube tv uh and and play it that way uh and that's so it took a little bit i had to set i had to, to specifically set aside time to do this and i just never got around to doing it until uh a about a month and a half ago and finally like i logged in and just really just kind of like knocked it out from there so that was my experience with it and it was an interesting one to say the very least and hold on i really this is going to drive me nuts i'm going to cut this part out um what the fuck is the name of that fucking thing is it's it gonna, it's not my hyperkin is it here it is. It's the Retro Tank. The Retro Tank uh, 5X is the newest one. There's also uh, there's a Retro Tank 4 or 4K or something along those lines. Um, so the Retro Tank is a really like cost effective way comparatively. It's still it's an expensive premium gadget, like the especially the 5X. Uh, it's like 700 bucks or some shit. But the 4 4K or something like that. The the model right before that was even. It is much more affordable and um it's pretty great from what i can tell uh and it does a great job of upscaling your video your old school games to like higher resolutions and everything but that's a different topic for a different day anyway we could probably get into the game in earnest now mick shall we oh please <laughs> oh man all right I, we're gonna save the story to the very end because i feel yes. like not not because it <laughs> in all honesty for those who are final fantasy fans and want to play them all the way through and don't want spoilers this game you can you don't need to know the story it's one of the i'll be honest make it's one of the worst stories i've ever experienced in my life <laughs> it's you're not wrong that's it, the best part it's so bad it is just so bad and i i have so many i have so many opinions on it but the gameplay is holds up a lot better. It's it's much. Eh, I don't think I like it quite as much as you, but let, let's go into it then. We'll start off with the gameplay. The it's a third person shooter where you play as Vincent Valentine and for you know from Final of Final Fantasy Seven fame, and it was originally like when the game was in development. I I, I didn't have a whole lot. I like I found one interview. I mean, I could, there's a lot of a uh, lot of them out there, but the one that I was, I, I had time to really sink my teeth into. They spent most of the time just talking about the bullshit story. I'm like, I don't care mm-hmm. about all this, all these motivations for characters that don't make any sense. Uh, so I, there wasn't as much info as I like to. And, uh, the little behind the scenes, just some stuff, uh, a little behind the scenes for for me. I ha- I'm dealing with some pretty big uh, personal life changes, good personal life changes that you know I was talking. Mick and I were talking about off mic, so I didn't get to research everything as much as I wanted to. But uh, one of the things I was able to look up was that they wanted to make a third person shooter just in general. They wanted to make some type of FPS specifically based off of Final Fantasy characters. So they even considered using like Irvine from Final Fantasy VIII, Yuna from Ten Two, uh, Barrett also from Final Fantasy VII because those are all characters who have guns. And they ultimately uh, chose Vincent, which in all honesty, I think was a smart choice. 
I think Vincent was a really good, like you, I, Vincent or Barrett, I think would have been smart. Uh, Irvine has not enough character to be worthwhile. And Yuna, it's just weird because she was, she w- uses a staff in 10, and then all of a sudden she ha- is dual wielding pistols in 10, too. Yeah, I, I've never understood that. But yeah, yeah, that, that is a really strange, strange change. And, and, and I'm with you. I, I, I think Irvine, like, I don't think he has enough personality or interest or things behind him that justifies a game vincent just seemed to make the most sense to to be sort of the choice for for a game because he was mysterious enough and a like enough of his backstory was either super vague or just not explained in seven where if you went with like barrett barrett pretty much has like his entire story resolved throughout the course of of seven you know you fight dine dine dies like he's got marlene so i think you could have done barrett but it wouldn't have made as much sense because from like a story i mean not that this story is sensical or (laughs) you know fulfilling in any way but uh i i think you know barrett wouldn't have been as good of a choice because again like we we kind of got all his resolution for him whereas vincent was mysterious and dark and different it's not a phase <laughs> it's not a phase no i'm with you on that i i think barrett definitely his story was resolved vincent was the smarter choice for all the reasons you laid out there and that that's one of the things they discussed a lot how there's like when they were trying to expand the world of final fantasy 7 they with with especially with the compilation of final fantasy 7 stuff you know we you mentioned before before crisis and then crisis core and everything lots of crises crises here in the final seven world um there is just a they they really had a lot to work with and one of the things that one of the craziest things and talk about expanding out this might tie in more with the artwork but you know one of the big things in final fan in vincent's story in final seven is lucrezia 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 how do you pronounce it i think he says lucrezia lucrezia that's what i thought yeah uh, she she has a like a minor role in the in in seven, you know, you can you can find out more about her doing side quests. So this really fleshes that out. Apparently, they didn't have a whole lot of reference material for her. They, they might not have even had like they might have tossed it from the original game because like if she had such a minor role, so they had to use guidebook portraits. I'm assuming like strategy guide portraits. I'm assuming that's what they meant by guidebooks and fan art. They used fan art to help wow. Kretia for this game which is kind of cool but kind of sad that they did not have any uh any like uh reference material for her uh, uh, when they were making this game. Yeah, that that's wild. I mean, it makes sense cuz I think you maybe see like her, you know, in-game sprite, you know, in like a flashback twice. And then other than that, she's the weird I I don't even think you you see her in the crystal cave. Like, I think it's just like a glowing light and it's vaguely shaped like her. Maybe I can't, I can't remember, but you it's again, it, it would make sense that there's not a lot of reference for them to work off of. Cause you, it, she's barely in seven. Cause you know, Vincent's backstory and everything from seven was essentially cut. You know, that's why he's a hidden character. Cause like most of his story stuff was removed. So that it makes sense. And man, they sure did some shit to his story in this game. Um, (laughs) They're like, we're going to add it all. Oh, yeah. But yeah, so it's a third person shooter where you play as Vincent. Uh, It's called Dirge of Cerberus because Vincent's gun is called Cerberus. I think that's like a dumb name for the game, like just name the game after his gun. Is there another reason that other than the name of the gun that you can think of? Am I going crazy? No, and it's weird because that is not what his ultimate weapon in seven is named. His ultimate, his ultimate weapon is the death penalty. <laughs> yeah, that's what his ultimate weapon is. And it looks completely different, too. It looks well, I mean, nothing like this. In 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 this game's defense, Cloud is known for his buster sword, even though it's not his best weapon in the game either. It's ulti- it's his ultima weapon. Yeah, um, I don't I don't think Vincent ever has a gun in seven called the Cerebrus. I don't think that's a thing at all. 
they you know what it is i think he has it in advent children mm-hmm. uh, that that the design of the gun like i don't think they ever refer to it as the cerebrus or anything but yeah his ultimate weapon is the death penalty uh because it's like the more enemies he uh kills with just a standard attack the stronger the attack bonus on the uh weapon goes up or something like that oh uh, so and it, it, that's like it's a permanent thing it's from battle to battle even uh yeah yeah the the more enemies vincent has like delivered the finishing blow to it's like the stronger that gun is so if you've used him a lot in the game and he's gotten like the final hit on a lot of enemies then the gun can be really strong if you haven't then it's awful because you get it at the end of the game and if you haven't used vincent a lot and then you equip this gun it's it's just terrible because uh, he's not killed. Yeah, now yeah. that makes so much more sense because there's a video you can see of vincent uh fighting against emerald and ruby weapon and i guess i don't know if it's because of a of a like a mod or if it's like built into the game and the devs just never thought to cap it but like there's a video you can see of vincent just like they, they basically utilize that that method and makes the death penalty do a shitload of damage so you he walks up to ultima weapon and you just see him do like a little gun troll the <laughs> shoots the ultra or not yep. ultima, i'm sorry emerald weapon and emerald weapon dies in one shot then he just puts his pistol away <laughs> Yeah, he, he yeah, because that's I think that's what he does. Like he like spins it, then shoots and spins it again or whatever, because it's it's almost like a little it's like a rifle the way the yeah. design looks or something along those lines. Yeah. So uh, in speaking of the Cerberus, though, and his weapons uh, that that goes into the next part of the gameplay, how the, the level up, how the like the gameplay mechanics work. So obviously you have third person shooter mechanics where you have a little aiming reticule or a sight or what have you, and you aim and you shoot and it's honestly there's a decent amount of auto aim too like it's pretty pretty lenient with this which which i'm grateful for because the it really does a bad job at like being precise with accuracy so they they do they give you a lot of grace with the auto aim so i'm actually pretty grateful for that but you you uh you can level up your gun. You can level up in different ways. There's different add-ons and different types of weapons you can use. There's like a submachine gun. There is a pistol, which is Cerberus, obviously. There is a rifle. There, I'm trying to. I'm blanking on the other stuff. All, all of a sudden, I can, I can look it up though. But uh, and there's different upgrades for each of those weapons and everything. And I don't know, like it. It was kind of cool because you could then customize the weapons with different, you know, short barrel or long barrel and or you can also add materia to it. So there was a lot like it it was interesting because you can pay for upgrades to individual parts of your weapon. You can upgrade Vincent overall, like in terms of his character level. And then you can also upgrade different abilities and whatnot. So like there's a lot of customization in this game. What, What are your thoughts, though, Mick? I think that's one of the things why I like it is because there is that, you know, customization and and, and ultimately like there are the most ideal choices to, you know, like equipping this thing with this thing. And but it just it feels cool, like because that was one of the neat things about seven was you could change up how you wanted a character to be based on the materia system. So if you wanted them to be like magic heavy, you could, if you wanted them to be a healer, they could be. So I think that's, that's one thing that I really dug about it was just that ability to modify and change your gun. Just felt like you had more input into the, the gameplay and the combat and things like that. And I forgot uh, the death penalty is in this game as well. It's the most powerful weapon. And, um, uh, well, wait, that's a spoiler, but um, we'll, and, we'll, and, we'll, we'll say, but yeah, but you didn't say how you get the death penalty. So don't worry. Yeah, you, yeah. you, you yeah. saved so yourself. You saved yourself. This yeah, this is not It is in the game. It's at the end of the game, though. It's the strongest weapon in the game. So that's why it's at the end. But yeah, I, I, I think that's why I dig it. I just like the the customization aspect because it one, it feels like kind of like, oh, this is a thing carried over from seven and and the materia system and, and it's just cool because visually the gun looks different when you use it and i'm a sucker for stuff like that I'm like mm-hmm. oh it, it's like in um uh symphony of the night when you change like the color of alucard's cloak it's the stupidest thing but i'm just like hey look it's a different color that's cool 
so I just I, I listed I looked up all the different weapons you get in the game. You have your handgun is a uh, serp like your your pistol. You have the Cerberus machine guns. You have the Griffin and the rifles. You have the Hydra, and then obviously you get like we already mentioned, death penalty. There are different like skill tree paths for each of them. For there's like P Cerberus and S Cerberus, and depending on which one you choose to level up to, like P Cerberus is. And this is the pistol. It P is for power. It's basically meaning it's it it, dra- it improves your your the damage that the weapon is able to do, and it also gives you higher accuracy, but at the but at the uh, cost of reducing firing rate and magazine capacity. The S Cerberus improves fire uh, rate and weight only. I don't understand how weight is helpful. I wonder if it's for melee attacks. Does it do better with melee attacks or something? I don't know. I, I genuinely don't know what the weight stat is useful for. Uh, I, I think I think it is melee related. Like you can attack quicker if well, it's a higher lighter weight. So it's uh, that must be what it is. I guess if it's a lighter weight, you can reload faster or something like that, or it's faster firing. I I, I genuinely am very confused by it. Um, because once there is like a maximum upgrade for each one so if you do the p cerberus the maximum upgrade is powered cerberus uh if you do s cerberus the maximum upgrade is zero cerberus if you do the maximum upgrade for m Cer- for m cerberus which is it improves on weight and stopping power and accuracy but they're not as much as the prs so like m cerberus is like a general like it's like the middle of the road like s cerberus if you want all fire rate and uh, weight and then power is at P servers is uh, all power and accuracy, but at the cost of the other things. And the M servers is like it'll do it'll give improvements to everything, just not quite as big as the improvements as the other ones would be. Um, you do also can get uh, an Ultima weapon, which I did not know. Uh, it is according to the wiki. This is the most powerful weapon of the handgun type, though. First, the player must upgrade a few very weak, seemingly joke weapons. It is not related to the Cerberus branches. That is really odd. I had no idea that even existed. Yeah, neither did I. Wow. Okay, it's pretty damn powerful, though. Its weight is only thirty, which is put in perspective. the The gun that's supposed to have like the lightest weight the zero servers is 120 so this thing is significantly lighter than it it's the fastest uh weapon in the whole game the fastest pistol at 140 but the way you upgrade it is with you get a model gun which has very little power it has one day like one power it that you do no damage to it so you have to go through three different levels of of joke upgrades just in order to level it up to be the most badass pistol in the game that's kind of nuts yeah that's super cool i I love little hidden things like that that's always that's that's always really fun but uh yeah so each I, I know that was a whole bunch of like proper nouns listeners p servers s servers m servers what does all that mean thank you namora for all even though once again he did not direct it for all these confusing names long story short each type of each one of these weapons the pistol the machine gun the rifle has different branching upgrade paths and they just have different names p whatever the name like the main pistol you have is cerberus so p s and m cerberus those are all the different pistol skill paths then the machine gun is called griffin and then the different skill paths are p s and m griffin you know p griffin s griffin m griffin and it's the same thing for the rifle which is the hydra so each one has um their own little path and upgrade but there is it does seem to be like there is like an ultimate version of each of these like for example in the machine guns there is a blast machine gun. This weapon is unrelated to the Griffin branch of guns, does not have very good stats, but is useful in its ability to knock down nearly all regular enemies. So there you go. Uh, and then you also can get a bayonet rifle too. Like, so it seems like there is like the regular version of the gun. And then there's like either upgraded or like joke versions of it type of thing. Um, but then you can also upgrade the barrels of your gun. You have normal short and long barrel. And then there's even like, if you if you look at like the the stats, there's like 
Cerberus one, Cerberus two, Cerberus three. Like, like every single thing has upgrades. I, I I feel like I'm going a little bit too in the nitty gritty, but it it does because of that. Like even the barrels have upgrades. Even like long barrel has like four or five different upgrades you can get to. Same with the short barrels. Uh, there's just lots of different options, and on top of that, there's different items like grav, like power booster, gravity floater, auto reloader, materia booster. Like there's a lot of different um, options that you can do. Like it, it's just so much excess or uh, variety in this. And I, as much as it didn't always click with me in terms of like how it came out in the gameplay, I am really glad with the options they give you. What are your What are your thoughts though, Mick? Uh, like I said, I, I just really like the fact that you can change it up. And to me, that's what makes like the combat interesting. As you said, it's a super easy game relatively uh, compared to other games that are, you know, of similar style. But I, I think just that ability to change your weapon, it make that's what I feel like makes the combat fresh and, and fun. Mm-hmm. Because it's like, oh, let me use the machine gun, even though it's doesn't do as much damage. I can fire quicker and maybe I incorporate that with like my melee attacks or let me use the rifle or just the standard service. So I, I think, again, that I just I really enjoy the customization and, be, you know, swapping it up and changing it. And because, uh, you know, this game does not it's not long by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I think it's like someone's like you can beat it in like 11 hours or something like that. So uh i feel like the style of gameplay is one of those things that really lends itself to playing missions over again to try and get like a higher score and do better to unlock additional stuff and and things like that so that's where it can stay engaging for me from a gameplay perspective because i can change things i think if it was just you have the cerebrus you can't change anything to it you have, you know, your melee attack and that's it. I don't think I would probably enjoy the gameplay as much. Um, and honestly, probably wouldn't be as as fun and would kind of be a bit of a slog because you're just like, oh, great. Just shooting people again with this shitty gun. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. One of the other things, too, uh, we, we should talk about is like we, we keep referencing that the game's easy. And I think the part of that is like i i know it's weird i had more challenge i had more difficulty with the general enemies than i did with the boss fights i Same. died more times like because enemies would like ex- periodically they would just like fuck your shit up man they would like wreck you pretty damn quickly and but then i would do a boss and I, I I don't know if it's because I like leveled up my guns in the right way or like i really focused on leveling up uh the like vincent like any time because at the end of each level at the end of each like section you ha- are given an option do you want to convert your experience to money so that way you can spend money on upgrades or do you want to keep your experience and level up vincent i almost always leveled up vincent um same and i i don't know if that was the smartest choice i'd be very curious t- to those who like min max everything like what is the proper way to min max your stats in this game but i always would uh give it to vincent and so the bosses just were always laughably easy like it really did not take me long to to beat some of these guys and it, it's the the only bosses that gave me trouble were ones that the mechanic didn't revolve around just you shooting at them in the face there's a couple that you actually have to like um you have to like what is it? there's like some enemies if i remember correctly you have to like shoot i'm I'm thinking i might be thinking of astral chain actually there there was a boss section towards the end of the game or like a mini boss where you had to like oh there was a boss that you could only use materia to defeat yeah and i never used materia at all in the game i didn't really find it particularly useful and I, I had to look up a guide a little bit because I'm like, I there's no way I have enough mana potions or like not potions, sorry, ethers to bring my MP points back. So like, what do you want me to do? And if you lure the boss over to different to these like different sections and you stand on them and they will he will like blow them up. And then it it turns into like an ether geyser pretty much like it refills your MP while you're there. And then you just 
it, then it goes away and you have to wait a little bit for it to be available to refill your MP again. But there's like six of them. So if you have them blow up all six, you can just keep hopping back and forth and having them refill your MP whenever you need to. Um, so th- th- I, I even forget which boss it is because like the story of this game is so fucking out, out of there that it's hard to remember who I fought in what order or why. Um but you yeah like that was the bosses were just so laughably easy to me i really did not struggle with them at all like they're the two of the early enemies in the game um shelk and what is that other dude's name hold on i have i have them right here it's shelk and i think it's azul, azul? yeah, yeah the big azul blue dude. Was, to me azul was like the easiest thing in the entire game <laughs> like he was so ridiculously easy in his fight. It's bonkers to me. It like he, he should not be that easy. Like it, it like and he the way they portray him in like the cutscenes is that he's unstoppable. And then and you go to fight giant. him. Yeah. His arms are like as big as your fucking face. <laughs> I don't know why I went with a weird voice. Hey, hey. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. <laughs> arms as big as the size of your head. Uh <laughs> that's and it, that'll go off on it not related uh don't worry about it listeners um but uh yeah they they really hype this character up only to have the fight just kind of be rare like and there's a bunch of moments like i'm i have the game i have a long play of the game on in the background right now just because like i was telling you off mike i beat this game a month and a half ago so i'm a little i need a little refresher yeah uh, same i had to go look at some stuff because i was like okay it's been a minute since i've played it what, what am i for <laughs> don't look through the rose colored lenses so much <laughs> well like azul is chasing vincent and reeves uh reeves as in the turks the reeves uh or the reeves sorry reeves as in from the turks and they're chasing him he's chasing them down a hallway vincent finds a fucking rocket launcher out of goddamn nowhere hell yeah brother <laughs> and <laughs> shoots it right into azul's face and Azul's like, oh, you just broke my shield or something. No, actually, sorry. He has his shield up. And I guess it like his shield does shatter. And he says something. He like says something to the effect of like, you broke my shield, you son of a bitch or something. Whatever the fuck. I don't know. <laughs> um, it's, such a, it, it's gripping dialogue, I'm sure. Whatever yeah. it is. There it is. Well done. You've broken through my barrier. Uh, they have subtitles on. And uh, yeah. It, that's pretty that's it and then you actually fight him and it's over pretty damn quick he doesn't move very fast he may have like a big powerful gun but he still goes down pretty easily so i i, I want to i have a theory that i would like to propose yes i feel like in some ways they said what if we made final fantasy metal gear solid and we have to have weird bosses that have like weird names, like Psychomanus, except you've got Shulk the Transparent and Azul the Cerulean. And they're all going to be have distinct looks and they're going to do distinct things. And you have to have gimmicks in the boss fights to beat them because holy shit, this game plays very much like Final Fantasy Metal Gear Solid. Except done worse. Well, yeah, that's not to say the problem is it's not as good, but it feels like they looked at it and that was like a huge inspiration for a lot of the things that you do, because Metal Gear Solid obviously is third person action. This is third person action, you know, the different weapons and things. Yeah, I just maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like Metal Gear Solid had a little bit of influence on this particular game. Well, what is it? This fight in particular with Azul that we're talking about? Doesn't it remind you of uh, who's the rate uh, the dude with the bazooka in, in first MGS? He's a raven. It's not Storm Raven. Vulcan What's... Raven. Yeah, he's got Vulcan the raven. giant Thank you. Uh, like mini gun that he walks around with. I mean, granted, that fight is way harder than this fight. It's still not a hard fight, but it's way harder than this fight is because holy crap. Every boss fight in Metal Gear Solid is harder than this fight. It is honestly mind boggling to me. Like I'm watching the long play right now and one this dude, whoever is, did the video for this, did an awful job of preparing for it because, like, I remember I could literally like take a shot at at Azul and like, like a 
tenth of his health would go down. I mean, a little bit less. It would take like twelve or fifteen hits. It really didn't take that long. Like I, I, I was able to whittle down his health really fast. Um, what you're supposed to do in that fight is you're supposed to lure him over to these explosive barrels and then shoot the explosive barrels. But I never had to do that. I could, I just shot him before he had a chance to do anything. I'm like, oh, he's gone. And I don't know, did, did I play on like too easy of a difficulty? I, I don't know. Like it, it was just crazy how easy this game was. And even the final boss, man, like the final boss took me a little bit to get to get used to because uh, it has a couple different mechanics that I'm not that they don't really tinker with or experiment with much throughout the game. But it, even that wasn't that hard. I think like looking back, I think the two fights that I had the most trouble with were the last two. No, just the last one, because the one before that is. I, it, once I figured it out and, and I, I'm trying to not delve into spoilers because it is a different combat mechanic sort of kind of um but once i got once i figured out like oh this is how you're supposed to do this one then it, it wasn't bad but the final fight i think was the most difficult and even then wasn't like insanely hard or, or anything uh and i guess that is sort of true most final fantasy stuff isn't necessarily hard it's just like once you figure out what to do, it's like, oh, OK, I, I, I kind of know the strategy here. This isn't this is really like minimal strategy <laughs> in any of the combat. Like you said, the the uh, just the standard enemies themselves feel like they're more challenging. Like if you get caught in a bad position or something like that or, you know, run out of healing potions, you're like, oh, I'm in trouble now. But against bosses it just never feels that way. It, yeah, it. Hmm. I'm trying to like I'm trying to scrub through just to see like scrub through this replay to see if I even remember any bosses that like really like were tough. Um, like and the only thing I can think of is maybe before because like you fight the final you fight who you think is the the final boss early on and you're supposed to actually lose to spoiler you're supposed to lose on the first t- try and then you get your powers back. And that then you have like a, a way to actually beat him a little bit later on. I I guess you I forget what exactly it is, but you're able to take him out. And uh, yeah, I'm watching the, the video of it now. It's just dodging a lot of his attacks, uh, Weiss's attacks. That's the main villain. Uh, well, sort of. Well, you'll find out more in the spoilers, listeners. Um, but most of his attacks are easy to dodge. And it's it's really it's really not like it really. The hardest part about the Weiss fight for me was just. Uh, getting hits on him like he he moves really quickly and well but it was really easy to dodge his attacks yeah i think it i think that's the same thing i had is is it was just it was so long and i think i just ran out of resources because eventually like he would hit me because i had such trouble hitting him well no it's funny you can if you run out of resources unless you run out of money there is a there is the the jukebox vending machines that they have and like the, the the vending machines where you get all of your weapons and items and healing stuff is just it's a jukebox it literally looks like a jukebox that you would see like a bar or something and they have one in the same room as the as the boss fight as in like either right before most boss fights sometimes in the room with the boss fight and in the fight with weiss it's in the same room so you could if you like you're running low I on never health notice that you could literally just run over and buy a bunch of health potions again i'm like all right so as long as you didn't like spend a lot of money you should be fucking fine that's funny I, so wait you never noticed that though no i never noticed that it was in the same room with weiss i was like oh man i ran out of stuff again damn it research that's really funny yeah i <laughs> i, I noticed, never noticed oh my gosh uh oh, god i feel stupid <laughs> that uh that's just that's really funny that's really funny well you'd be forgiven because it, it is a little chaotic in that final fight especially the first version of that you do like you're supposed to lose and everything um i'm trying to think if there's any other elements of the gameplay that i want to talk about though we've talked about the bosses we've talked about the leveling up system uh how you can either choose to spend money on the different weapon upgrades or you can level up vincent himself with just uh, choosing instead of you know you can either take the money and use it on weapon upgrades or take the experience excuse me and level up vincent 
So you you know you can kind of choose whichever you prefer. Um, I'm trying to think. There is that one random level where you play as Kate Sith. I actually like that one because it's like the stealth level, and I it made me excited when I first played the game because like oh man am I going to play as like more people, you know, cause I'm thinking like, Oh man, am I going to play as like Barrett or Yuffie or cause Yuffie's in the game as well as, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Reeve as, as Kate, as Kate Sith. But, uh, so I, I was like pumped. I was like, Oh man, like, are, is this going to be a thing? Like, am I going to have like, or, and I also thought there was the chance that I would have a team up level or something like that. And mm-hmm. you know, it doesn't, doesn't really, not really a thing, um, but yeah, so I enjoyed the the one like you could sneak it around a, as him because it was just it was a, a nice little break in the action gameplay to throw in some stuff. Like I said, Metal Gear Final Fantasy. That is I feel like they're inspired by it. I I wouldn't have minded that level if it wasn't for the fact it just kind of felt so out of place compared to the rest of the game. Like games that do that, I don't mind if if it's something that they consistently ask you to do periodically like ratchet and clank for example a lot of times in ratchet in the ratchet and clank games you have you know your normal gameplay as ratchet with clank on your back but then there's some sections where only clank can go to so you have these fun little like puzzle combat sections mostly puzzle that then they give you like three or four maybe five throughout the game so it it and they get progressively difficult, more difficult, and they use it as a way to break up the flow of the gameplay. So it's not just constantly just straight up action. They, you know, they make you do some puzzle solving. And I like that a lot. But this, it doesn't feel like actual puzzle solving. It's just like, all right, a mechanic that you have not seen before, really, and you seldom see again. There is moments, there are missions where you have to sneak through as Vincent in a couple different locations, if I'm remembering correctly. Or am I thinking of Astral Chain again? I, I can't remember yeah, I anymore. I don't remember having to sneak through as Vincent because I'm thinking of Astral those... Chain then. I don't know why I keep conflating these two games. They're both very anime. That must be it. Yeah, I was going to say they're they're very anime. I, I do wish that we got more. K- again, it's like he said, the downside is it's just the one part and then you don't do it again. And it's kind of like, well, why is it in there? And that, like you know, and again, when you realize like, well, you just don't do this again. It, it's disappointing in that sense. But when I first played through, I was super pumped. I was like, oh, this is awesome because, you know, maybe I'll play as Yuffie and I'll have to like sneak through and do the Yeah. And nope, you no, you just don't do that. <laughs> it's, it's just they're like, ah, we're going to throw this this little cat in there because, you know, it's Final Fantasy seven. We need to remind you that there are more connections to Final Fantasy seven in this game. <laughs> Aside from the one that you're going to get. Oh, yeah, yeah yeah uh any you know what we can get into that in just a moment we will have to talk about the the visuals and the music and quick first but before we get to that any final thoughts in the gameplay man i feel like we've covered it pretty well you know we've we've talked about the leveling up system we've talked about the one random kate sith level we've talked about the bosses the the uh, you know what it We'll save the final talk because there is one section we have not talked about, and it's kind of like a plot twisty type of section. So we'll yeah, save that for when we talk spoiler, about the spoilers. It's definitely spoilerish, but uh, it is fun. I did enjoy it, uh, and it's it's cool. It reminds me of Near a little bit, or Near mm-hmm. Automata. Yeah, that it reminded me of that a bit. Yeah, I could, I could, I see. I haven't played Near though. You're talking about Automata. Yeah, yeah. Because oh. it's sort of shmup esque like almost. yeah yeah it's a little bit shmup esque uh it's eh, i see i with without going into too much to it i love the idea of it but it went on a little bit too long for my liking it is pretty yeah it's, it's, it's a, they really wanted to drive it home which i get you know it's yeah I get, but the pacing just felt a little bit too drawn out, a little bit too long for my liking. And it basically listeners without going into any like not once again, not like fucking spoilers matter for this game. This game is fucking <laughs> stupid. None this of the story make is sense fucking anyway. You know what? No, fuck it. We're going to say we're, we'll give it without context. Long story short, Vincent gets goes full Super Saiyan at the end because he. Oh, yeah, he does. <laughs> he basically remembers he 
one of the, one of the big plot lines of this game, and this is the only plot Mufasa part where... reminds him who he is. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, rest in peace, James Earl Jones. Um, yes. Freaking. Basically, there is the 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 story, the premise of this game. I guess we could have at least talked about like why Vincent is shooting all these people at the top of the episode, but whatever. We're maniac. about an hour into the recording yeah. now, so fuck. <laughs> It basically uh, it this game takes place three years after the events of Final Fantasy seven and this evil organization called Deep Ground <laughs> Deep Ground suddenly appears and you find out it was a military. It was part of a covert Shinra operation that was to create genetically enhanced super soldiers. Uh, I'm reading so I'm paraphrasing some of this off of Wikipedia just to make it a little bit easier. Um and they come out three years later and they just kind of want to take over the world. And they talk about needing to control Omega. And basically there's these ancient tablets that was discovered years ago about these beings called chaos and Omega and how they have this unknown, but important relationship and uh, chaos described as Omega squire to the lofty heavens, the chaos and the chaos gene was injected into Vincent over 30 years ago by Lucrezia. Um, and the, I know I'm spoiling a little bit more than I said I would, but fuck it. Uh, then the Omega gene is injected into who you find out later to be um, uh, this character named Weiss, who you keep referencing over and over and over again. And you don't really know who they, they, you keep hearing references to, I should say. Well, Vincent at the end of the game learns to, like the chaos gene is the reason why in final fantasy seven vincent goes like berserk mode into weird different animals and stuff like that that's kind of the they they use that as a story reason as to like the experiments that the, the turks did to him that the original game the original final seven left ambiguous and kind of left up to your imagination in this game like now now we're going to explain it he got the chaos gene uh invested you know injected into him chaos and he basically at the end of the game learns to become one with the chaos gene. Like he, he no longer kind of like how there's like, if you in like Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, how some of the Saiyans learn to be sentient. Like they don't go berserk in when they're, when they go in their full eight mode, that kind of thing. Same idea. Uh, he, he, he keeps his sentience, but he gets to go into berserk mode at the same time. And he gets this fucking badass weapon, uh, what was it called again, Mick? The death penalty. The death penalty, yeah. He gets his badass weapon, the death penalty. It kills every enemy in one hit. It's awesome. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. And then you fight your way through this like very Nomura-ass ending to Kingdom Hearts. It looks like something straight out of the ending of Kingdom Hearts. Like floating shit all over the place. Nonsensical shenanigans. Flashbacks to things that you don't care about. Uh <laughs> It's it's just it's just bonkers, and so you you go through and you end up fighting the final boss, which ends up being Omega, and that's kind of like that. That's the section that we we were alluding alluding to is like the final portion of the gameplay where you play as Chaos Vincent and you just go fucking full berserk. Well, not full berserk. You just go full. You just you just go balls to the wall and just fucking blow the shit out of everything. It's awesome. I, I will say, I think from a design standpoint and the way that this game looks, it's awesome. Like, it looks cool. And, like, the characters are coolly designed and they're all very unique. And for it to be a PS2 game, still looks pretty damn good, you know, con you c considering. Um, because some PS2 games have not aged well at all. This one's aged fairly well, but... I suppose at the same time, some of the levels aren't really going to age poorly because they're kind of plain. It's like, oh, it's a cobblestone street and, you know, the same like building layout that you see in a few, you know, so I guess that's why. Um, but yeah, I, I think it, it from a visual standpoint, it's aged fairly well. And like you said, that it's one of those things at the end where it's just like, God, this looks cool. 
damn it, the story sucks. <laughs> what a perfect transition, though, Mick, uh, <laughs> to the visuals and the overall aesthetics, you know, visuals, music, and overall aesthetic of the game. You're right, man. This game looks really good for a PS2 title. Like, it, it really holds up. The art direction is really good. As much as, like, the, the character designs are super anime and super zany, I, I don't necessarily begrudge the designs all that much as long as they don't look abhorrent and they don't like they're not always my cup of tea but like they don't also don't look bad the color selection is really nice like all the vi- levels look visually really really nice like they, they it's like like right now I'm, I'm watching like i said i've been having a video of a long play on in the background and they're going through vincent's fighting through the great the train graveyard and that's getting like in terms of the the pacing of the story it one of the, my issues with the story is like it's a little like like back heavy like it there there's like really decent pacing in the beginning and then the last half of the game like you feel like all right we're starting to wrap up the story and then you still have like five hours left to play and the game's only 10 hours like you basically wrap up a large portion of the story in the first five hours and then the last of it there's like two plot twists and then they reveal all to all that to you over the course of two hours or some shit. It's it's kind of silly. Anyway, uh, so one the reason I, I bring all that up is because the train graveyard is in that section. I, I, I just realized how out of place, that, out of left field that might have sounded. But the, the train graveyard is in this kind of final back heavy section. And I'm like looking at the timestamp on the video. I'm like, this video is only nine hours long and we're five hours in. And this like there's still about half the game left. Like what the hell is wrong with this? But uh, yeah, the, just everything about it. Like the colors are great. The, the detail on the character models is really good for a place for a PlayStation two title. Um, the music is pretty decent. Uh, the, the CG graphics for like the pre-rendered movies are stunning. Like there's just so much to like about this game visually. What are your thoughts though? No, I, I think you nailed it. Um, because Nomura did the the character designs, which makes sense. Like that, that's something that he excels so well at is is character design and making them look unique. And uh, they really did a great job. And again, I guess have this coming after Advent Children helps. Uh, this coming after Crisis or no, I think Crisis Core came out after this. Yeah, you know what? Let I can double check for you. I'm, I'm pretty um, sure it did. It would have had to because it was PSP, and that was during the PS3 era, I believe. Yes, uh, this game came out in 2006, January 26, 06 in Japan, August 15th, 06 in North America, and Crisis Core came out on September 13th, 2007, Japan, and then March 25th, 2008 in North America. Okay, so. Uh, well, so yeah, I guess they just looked at a lot of some stuff from Advent Children, but I think honestly, I think it is a better design for a lot of the areas than Advent Children does. Advent Children, I don't know, had that weird kind of like, it had a very strange color palette for me, but, um, I think they nailed it, especially because, you know, you go back and look at like Final Fantasy VII and some of the designs for those areas do haven't hadn't aged well so for them to you know like what nine years later make them look good in a 3d space and you know with a good color palette and like the fact that it's lasted oh man so many years i don't want to think about it's been this game's almost 20 years old yeah it's it's oh, vast no. it's quickly approaching it for damn sure 2006 we're only two years away from it mick oh no uh I'm so old. <laughs> uh, no. Um, so I think that's just like the coolest thing is like it's aged well. It looks good. And when you look at things like Final Fantasy VII Remake and things like that, they they look like they're in the same universe. They look like they belong together because of the the color palettes are good, like everything. So I'd be curious to know like how much reference has Dirge of Cerebrus been used for later Final Fantasy VII projects when they're building out Midgar. It's funny. I joked around with um, Colby uh, from... Because it's funny. Earlier this year, I co- I covered Crisis Core. 
You know, I, I did Crisis. I played Crisis Core for the first time. Actually, probably this time last year, I was starting my playthrough of Crisis Core, um, or, or, or right around this time, maybe a little bit later. Uh, and also a great game. It, I I really enjoyed my time with it. Storyline's not quite as cuckoo bananas as this, so, so that that's a win. But uh, the, <laughs> no, what, I don't think hardly anything can be though. This game, oh, I know I it, this game is just bonkers. But no, so what the um, I I like what I was saying in in the Crisis Core episode. The reason I brought it up is that that game heavily revolves around like fate and stuff like that which is very is a huge theme of the seven remake series like you know changing fate and what's your fate and you know all that other shit and colby and i were joking around about how much of it was like wow they were really thinking about this fate shit since like (laughs) since 2008 and like looking at this um like I wouldn't I don't know how much of it is still used now, how much of it laid the foundation for what we're used to now, but it's it, like, I don't know. It, it still kind of works, though. Like, I could see a lot of the I think like in terms of the color palette, a lot of it is used for like what you see. I, I feel like if anything, a lot of visual reference was used for what they ended up doing in seven remake and rebirth and whatnot, not necessarily in terms of graphics and stuff like that, but just kind of like almost like a, like a, like a tone Bible, if that makes sense, like the tone of the world created here, I feel like meshes really well with what I remember uh, uh, remake was because I haven't played rebirth yet. I just started it. I'm not super far into rebirth. So um, yeah, I'm not far at all into it, but uh yeah, it's it's crazy. It's cool. I did play the remastered Crisis Core, though, and man, the similarities between the levels. with And, and I would get the feeling they probably recycled some assets because why wouldn't you? I mean, uh, especially the um, the calm one or the, the first Midgar area, like it looks almost identical to one of the first sections in crisis core where you're running around fighting stuff. It, it's damn near identical. So I feel like they probably recycled some assets because I mean, why not? It's there, right? Probably, probably I, I didn't play See, I didn't even get to play the remake of crisis core. I just played the, the, my original on the PSP. One thing I will say, since we're talking about like kind of visuals and overall aesthetics, man, I really miss this era of gaming just aesthetically with like the, the way the health bar look the health bars look the way that the the menu systems look and everything like that like and i understand it is completely like a biased thing for me like i i, I can't say it's better or worse like i can't say oh it's gotten worse or anything like that i just like how it looks like it 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 scratches my nostalgia pretty pretty damn hard so i really i really enjoy looking at like how this game this game's ui works and everything like that it's it's really fun to look at i just i just like the visual aesthetic of this game is fantastic in general the voice acting is i would almost blame the voice direction for any issues with the voice acting because like i know like steve bloom he's a fantastic voice actor i if a lot of it just feels very stale and stilted to me but i i know i just jumped i just jumped topic so before we get into that uh Mick, what are you what are your like do you agree with what i was saying about the ui like do you do you enjoy the ui are you are you nostalgic for it um i i do but you know i think i think it's just that era of gaming to the you know the ps2 and and you know that throwback to final fantasy in there as well like i so i think that's what it is it just it makes my brain happy to look at it like yeah this is this is nice uh it I, I sort of agree with you on the voice acting as well, uh, which it is strange because it is a great cast. Like when you look at some of the names in it, it is some freaking heavy hitters. So I think you're right. It's got to be either like a translation thing or a direction thing or something because they're the people are way too talented that are voicing this game to deliver some of the performances that they do in this game. So yeah, I did want to add that in there. Exactly, man. Like there, there is so much talent in this game. I just, I cannot wrap my head around 
why some of the the choices being made are so just it just almost nonsensical like it just it doesn't there's lots of lines in here where the dialogue just really doesn't seem like it it works or it feels very stilted or it and you know i i I trust your opinion much more than my own since you do do voice acting work you know so like i'm just i'm just going based off my own you know proclivities and things that i you know what that what i'm used to but it's just like who let's let's Actually, you you brought up the voice talent. The voice talent you have Steve Bloom as Vincent Valentine. You have Carrie Walgren as Shelk. Uh, you have those are the two. Oh, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, Steve Bloom's mm-hmm. wife, as Rosso. Yep. Um, May Whitman is in this as Yuffie. Is she still the voice of Yuffie? Uh, I don't think so. I, I'm I, I don't think so. But like Rachel Lee Cook is Tifa is, is Tifa. Yep. Bo, Bo Billingsley, Billingsley is Barrett like Robin Atkins down is uh, someone who shall be named later. Paul Eiding is someone who should be named later, which that was actually kind of odd. Uh, I didn't remember that Paul Eiding did. What I uh, see. I don't know Paul Eiding. What has he done as well? Colonel Campbell from Metal Gear Solid. OK, there yeah. we go. Here's the thing that gets me like the additional voice acting uh names are, are unbelievable like would you see that you're like how like johnny young bosch is a is background johnny bosch character i yeah. don't see him yeah. on the list but i i doesn't mean he's not it's just you know the he's just, he's what they he's what they call an incidental character okay that that makes sense yeah then. so he's just background actor but like the, when you look at that list it's like wendy lee debbie may west johnny young bosch yuri lowenthal colleen o'shaughnessy um wow Doug Erholtz, uh keith ferguson uh liam o'brien like there are some insane like some of them i get because of when this came out so like they probably recorded it in like 2005 you know pr- more than likely um but johnny young bosch and why is he not like a main character That's he was already because when did bleach co- start coming out in the u.s like i i knew him from trigun as vash the stampede but yeah like, yeah he you know he was already like uh, he's an Akira. like he, he yeah he had, like he, he, he seems like he was deal. big enough that he would have gotten a lead role for something in this. Maybe he just yeah, wanted to be in a Final Fantasy game. Yeah, it's it's so strange to me because like at that point, I guess like Yuri Lowenthal wasn't like a huge name. Liam, Liam O'Brien was starting to become a bigger one. Wendy Lee, things like that. Um, but at that time, I mean, you're talking Steve Bloom, Bo Billingsley, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn. That that's Cowboy Bebop right there. Almost the whole damn cast. Wait, is Mary in, Elizabeth in, McGlynn in Cowboy Bebop? Yeah, she's um, Julia. Oh, wow. That is I, I, I see. I think so. I actually was at a oh, convention. Oh, and Wendy Lee's Faye. So you have the whole damn cast of Cowboy Bebop in this. That's and really funny. An, and she's an incidental character. So, again, it's it blows me away how some I'm like, what? why are some of these people doing that? Like, I think Rachel Lee Cook voiced Tifa in Advent Children. I'm yeah. I, want to say i don't know that may whitman voiced yuffie in it she, maybe she did i don't know may whitman has voiced yuffie in kingdom hearts as well so yeah she's just the voice of yuffie i guess huh good for that's, her that's that's since kingdom hearts 2 it's funny because like i know she she first got famous and uh, rachel lee cook excuse me got famous and she's all that but I I always remember she's a love interest of the of the main character of Sean from Psych. If if you've watched Psych, she plays a plays a small role in that. Well, not a small actually, huh. a recurring character, I should say. Wow, she really I didn't realize how much voiceover work Rachel Lee Cook has done. Um I think like, yeah, I think she largely transitioned to doing doing that. Like Mae Whitman's done a ton of uh voiceover work as well, which I didn't realize she did as much. Hmm. Yeah, Rachel Lee Cook has just basically been Tifa and everything except the remake. Uh, they they recast her. They recast That's the role because they recast everybody for for the remake. Yeah, Final Fantasy yeah. VII. But she's been Tifa since two thousand six. That's nuts. Uh, yeah, in Final Fantasy Seven Advent Children. That's that's nuts. Um, 
But yeah, uh, the it's yeah. But the, with the voiceover performance, you're like I don't think we can really emphasize enough. Just the level of talent in this is just insane, and the fact that it just so much of it feels so stilted. Specifically, who's the voice actor for? Um, Paul Eiding. Paul Eiding is the character we're going to mention later. Yeah. I can't stand the performance. Like I, I hate it, and I'm. I don't think it's his fault. I think it's he's just shitty great, directing. Yeah, he he's great. Like, um, he 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 is really good at delivering like really emotionally charged performances. Like I said, I didn't realize he was this character. Um, so that's kind of weird. Uh, it's probably not a role I would have ever pegged him to do it's not really what he usually does um but yeah it's 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 strange that he's because as like colonel campbell he's amazing like he's so so good i don't really have much else to say about the visuals and overall aesthetics and like kind of all that stuff anything do you have anything on the music at all like i i can't think of much about the music in all honesty like it's fine yeah that, that is kind of where i'm at with it i'm like yeah it's fine yeah it sounds like final fantasy 7 <laughs> you know, it's it's not uh, probably not as good because there's like a few pieces. Obviously, they they don't really use that Final Fantasy seven is like super known for. Um, so, yeah, I, I it's fine. It's there, <laughs> though. They do have like a, a licensed song from Gact at the end of the game, don't they? There's a very specific reason why they do. Yeah. <laughs> uh... It takes okay. us into spoilers, but yeah, there, there's a reason why they do. Well, you know what? Let's get into the spoilers then, Mick. Let's yeah. go into story. Fuck this. Let, let's let's wrap this up with the mo- like. Normally, I keep the story to the end of the episode because oh, I don't want people to, you know, this game, you really need to, you need to experience it. You need to, you know, you, I don't want to spoil anything for you. No, 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 fam. Don't, you don't need to worry about spoilers for this. This <laughs> game is a job right. and a half. I want to try to just kind of do a really brief recap of like the events of this, because there is a lot that happens. Um, Long story short, I mentioned the beginning how or earlier on how deep ground was a bunch of soldiers, like was an experiment done by Shinra of like this secret group of people who are uh, trying to be getting like these experiments done to turn them into super soldiers. There is an organization headed by f- former leader of the Turks, Reeve, called the World Regenesis Organization, and it's an organization dedicated to helping the planet recover from the events of Final Fantasy VII, quote-unquote, from Wikipedia. Um, and it's pretty much the Deep Ground versus the World Regenesis Organization, and that's pretty much the the main uh, – the two factions, as it were, in this game. and you as Vincent are trying to help help out because you obviously you're a good guy. You want to do the right thing. And, you know, Reeve, I, the, what's weird about this is like, you know, if you remember from final fantasy seven, Reeve is Kate Seth. And it's just weird to me how like they kind of treat them as one of the same in this, but not it. I, I can't stand Kate Seth as a character. It just confuses the shit out of me anyway. Um, so yeah, you, you were helping Reeve out. And as you, kind of learn more about the people who are fighting against you. They're called the Sviets and very Russian sounding. And they, they especially who's the, who's the red lady, Mick? Do you remember what her character's name is? Uh, Rosso, the crimson Rosso, the crimson. Yes. Yeah. That's uh Mary Elizabeth McLean. Okay. She eats the fucking scenery in this game. It's wonderful. Like she's a fun villain. Like she's really fun to watch. I, I'll, I'll give full props to that. Um, but you, they keep, you know, deep ground is keep trying to they're, they're trying to help out this character named Weiss. And they're always saying, hail white vice or hail Weiss. And I think they say vice. I think they pronounce it with a V. Um, and they're, they're basically they're tr- the Sephiroth of this game or supposed to be. Yes. And you, you fight a lot of these char- these like very it is very Metal Gear Solid. You're, you're right. Like it's inst- like. You have all these special agents that you're having to fight in different boss fights. You have Azul, you have Rosso, you have a whole bunch of other. One of them is Shelk. And Vincent finds that one of the scientists that works for the WRO is the sister of Shelk. And so there's this whole family drama, you know, like it's the sister that like the sister that the older sister is Shalua. The younger sister is Shelk and Shalua like 
was separated from her at a young age and thought like she lost her and she was always looking for her. And now she finds her now that she was experimented on and Shelk is pretty much like more of a cyborg at this point. She's like more of a robot than she is human kind of. Also, I would like to, I, I, I want to inject this because it supports my uh, claim. Uh, Jalula is voiced by um, Kim May Guess, who voices mm-hmm. Mei Ling in the Metal Gear Solid series. <laughs> This is just bonkers. How it's, deep does this rabbit hole go? It, it's Metal Gear. Metal uh, Gear. Espe- because, like, bro, we're like, they even have the fu- a, a, a nano machines equivalent in this damn game. Do With they? The, um, oh, they, yeah, the, 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 um, what is it? it it's like a really, st- the synaptic net dive. Oh, it's fucking, yeah. The, yeah, it's nano machines. <laughs> like, it's so fucking stupid. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. You know what? I'm just going to, we'll do this. Uh, I'm going to read a, a paragraph here and there from the Wikipedia because it's it'll be better than I can explain it. It's a little bit more precise, uh, concise. Reeve explains to Vincent that the soldiers were members of Deep Ground, a military organization created as part of a covert created as part of a covert Shinra operation to create genetically genetically enhanced super soldiers. Vincent soon learns that he is one of Deep Ground's primary targets as he is unknowingly in possession of this thing called the Proto-Materia. It is a substance which he uses to control the chaos gene that I talked about beforehand within him. Chaos. chaos. There we go. We literally... Yeah! I heard it at the exact same... Like, as you said it, I know there's an <laughs> input delay. You said it the exact same time I was saying it, even though I know it came. Anyway, I'm over explaining. God, speaking of amazing games, uh, and uh, they need they need the proto materia because Deep Ground claims they need to control Omega. And according to ancient tablets discovered years ago, Chaos and Omega have an unknown but important relationship. And with Chaos described as being Omega's squire to the lofty heavens, the Chaos gene was injected into Vincent over 30, year ago, 30 years ago by the scientist Lucrezia Crescent, Hojo's research assistant, whom Vincent was in love with. And Lucrezia is very, like, she hates that she's done this to Vincent. That is a major theme in this game of how she has a like you don't actually see her really in person you see lots of flashbacks of her and some other things and so you never actually get to see her in person per se uh but in a lot of the flashbacks you see she's very remorseful for doing this to vincent and vincent is still like head over heels for her um in an effort to find answers, Vincent goes to the town of Nibelheim where Lucrezia studied Omega and Chaos. And while at Lucrezia's research lab, Vincent is ambushed by Ross the Crimson who steals the proto-materia, but is prevented from killing Vincent by Yuffie showing up. So Yuffie does show up this. Um, and they, what is it? They do end up going into like the WR headquarters run by Reeve does get assaulted by Deep Ground and Vincent has to come back and save them. Uh, Deep Ground member Shelk, the transparent, as you mentioned, I for, totally forgot they have like different names after it's not just Shelk, it's Shelk the transparent. It's captured by the WRO, and she reveals that she is synaptically interconnected to Lucrezia's memories, allowing the WRO Man, to complete is. Lucrezia's research on Omega. Shelk's sister, Shalua who is also a high-ranking scientist of the WRO, discovers that the Omega is a weapon, that Omega is a weapon which activates when the planet senses it is in mortal, mortal danger. Omega's function is to absorb the life stream of the planet and then move to another planet, leaving the inhabitants behind to die. Deep Ground's plans to slaughter a huge number of people at once so it to trick the planet into activating Omega prematurely. Why the fuck? Why? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, even the plot twist at the end, the the guy just wants to rule the world or some shit. Like, there's no world for him to rule. Like, I don't understand the, like, I didn't even understand that the live stream will, like, fuck, like, Omega will just pick up the live stream like it's in a fucking suitcase and just be like, all right, I'm off to work, honey. Here's to, we're moving. It's so strange because it, um, it sort of contradicts what they laid out in Final Fantasy VII, what what the weapons were, because yeah. you know the the idea was like, oh well, Omega and Chaos aren't are weapons. Oh, but they're not weapons, and they'll transport the life force 
you know, to somewhere else from the planet, which is like, so where, where were these assholes when Sephiroth was trying to suck up the life force? Like, you know, because the other weapons showed up to protect the planet from, yeah. you know, it being attacked. So it just, yeah, it, it's confused in its own lore. And it's like, well, no, 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 it's expanding on it. It's like, no, it, it's not. It's just weirdly weird and confusing. And like he said, you, I, I, I don't really understand Weiss's goals because they're not his. It, I, do we do we reveal? No, go, go go ahead right into it because essentially right after you they find this out what this is what the plan that uh the wr or the the deep ground wants they launch a full-scale attack on deep grounds headquarters in midgar which is what i was mentioning before about going through the cr- the train graveyard that's how vincent gets into it and like i said this is halfway through the story and it feels like okay you know the villain you know what they're going to do we're just going to fucking attack them so i'm like okay this is like near the climax it's not there's a lot of game left yeah it, it's it's kind of wild but the the big reveal is that weiss is dead but he's not actually dead he's like unconscious or in a coma so he's hojo being, he's being manipulated by the life force of hojo Yes, because Hojo, uh, he died in Final Fantasy VII. Like, you fight him, uh, and I think at the beginning of the game, we see, like, a flashback of Vincent, like, trying to go and see, like, Hojo's body or see that he's dead, and and then he was gone or he vanished or whatever. Um, but So Hojo is dead, but he uploaded, like, a digital copy of his mind and then went and took over Weiss's body through the synaptic net dive. It's basically the well, same thing that like Shelk has for Lucrezia's memories, but he used it to get into Weiss's body. My understanding is that the synaptic net dive that they keep talking about, it connects it. It's connected to the life stream. Like they are, it's like they're hacking the life stream is what I understood of it. Maybe I'm completely wrong with that. They I, really, I, they really made not, it. So- yeah, it might be. They really uh, made I was it sound confused. like they just like they just kind of treated like what's the live stream except just a bunch of like memories and data and all this other shit and memories of previous lives and that's just data. I I I, I could have sworn that they uh that they like hacked into the live stream quite literally. Um and it's funny because then Shelk does that later on to help Vincent figure stuff out. She's like since she has Lucrezia's memories cuz otherwise there's no I, but then she also has it through hacking into may I don't know. I'm very confused by it. She has, yeah, no, it, it's so confusing. Mm-hmm. It, it's so confusing. And again, I, I don't know if it's like one of those lost in translation things or one of those just like, Oh, it's anime bullshit. Um, I, it literally is the final fantasy, the equivalent of nano machines. It's like, we need to explain it. Synaptic net dive. That's what it is. And it's like, well, what is that? Well, doesn't really matter it just makes it it, it's the MacGuffin that just makes impossible shit possible ultimately uh my biggest thing that confused me is so the Shinra building was a giant fucking machine the whole time (laughs) like damn Rufus really missed out on utilizing some of the technology at his disposal when he was around right Sorry, I'm just double checking this. It, it it's not they don't hack the live stream. They go into the worldwide network, and Weiss was looking on the worldwide network to find a cure for a virus, uh, the virus the restrictors had infected him with. Sorry. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's why he was in like who the, the coma fuck are the restrictors? Whatever. I don't even. I don't know who were they. I don't remember them. I don't. Oh my god, this game. It what can you repeat the last thing you said because i was reading trying to find out like am i going crazy about the hacking the live stream thing what was the last thing you said before i figured out that there is no Uh, hacking the live stream when the shinra building transforms into a giant machine you know it basically transforms into a mega or whatever it's like how how the hell didn't rufus just use this in final fantasy 7 like did he not know like was it not ready like what the hell happened um so yeah, it, it it's one of those things that 
I appreciate that it does a lot of its own things. Like it doesn't just say, oh, well, we need to literally make this Final Fantasy seven as much as we can. It goes in its own directions. It tries its own things. But at the same time, some of the things that it does make no sense because it's like, well, why didn't they just have that happen in Final Fantasy seven? It's been three years, you know, like the whole deep ground thing. I get it They, you know, they're like clandestine or, you know, whatever. And they've been in hiding and they're like ultimate, ultimate black op type stuff. Like, sure. Yeah. That, that makes sense. And I, I understand like Hojo knowing about them because that would make sense too. Like he's the head researcher. He was doing all sorts of experiments and shady shit. You know, he helped create Sephiroth and, and all that. So I, I, I get it in that regard, but like some of it is just like, man, you guys really wanted to figure out a way to up the stakes to make it feel like it was important and it mattered. But I feel like you stretched the putty just a bit too far and it started to rip. Absolutely. It, the, <laughs> that is, uh, that's pretty spot on, man. That's, yeah, that's, uh, I think it just, I think what this game really does in terms of story, that it irks me so much. It's one of those things where not everything needs to be explained. And this game explains a bunch of shit that you just don't need to, that you really like having Lucrezia be this mysterious, like she's a former Shinra researcher who like worked with the Turks and all this other stuff. Like you don't need, like even if they included some of the backstory to her on this, like the amount of melodrama that is involved with the cutscenes of her, like there, there's a there's a section when Vincent comes to grips with chaos is he meets um he sees Lucrezia like underneath a tree in the middle of a field. It's the most anime melodramatic thing I've ever seen, and you're just having like I don't know. There, there's so much with this story, like. <sighs> Okay, sorry. I, I'm jumping all the place. Let me talk about specifically what really got under my skin. When you find out that Hojo is actually the main villain and he possesses Vice, right? Um, it, uh, ugh, God, it bugs the shit out of me. It's so stupid. It, 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 Hojo, I think, is one of the worst villains in just period. Like, I, I don't like that they've turned like they really it really feels like they're trying to turn turn him into kind of like a kafka-esque villain yes and that's why i think it bugs me because he never struck me as that kind of character he's very much a henchman like that's kind of his level he's he's you know uh you've played final fantasy 4 right yes it's been a while been a while he's, but yeah he he's he's like dr uh Lu- Gay um who builds like the robot or whatever that you uh fight on um the tower of babel like that's who he is he's just the the mad scientist like nah, 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 and and that's it he's not he's not a, a main villain he's not kefka but like you said it's like they're trying to make him into that and it drives me crazy again and i i, I hate to be this guy about it because I'm, you know, it, I I love the people who are probably listening. They're like, I thought Mick said he liked this game. I do. The story is ridiculous, though. In Final Fantasy VII, he's actively trying to help Sephiroth destroy the planet, and then he's like, "Now I'm going to become Omega, and this and that." And it's like, wait, what? Why? So the, why didn't you just do that back then? And it, I think the thing is like the reason why Kefka works as that as the villain that Kefka is, is because Kefka literally does become the fucking villain. It be, he becomes the primary antagonist of the game. And spoiler alert for Final Fantasy VI, um, that it, it is a bit of a plot twist when that is revealed. But like, it if Hojo wants to be Kefka. They needed to have him like somehow like Sephiroth not end up being the main villain of Final Seven and Ke- and Hojo take over, but they don't. Ke- uh, keep wanting to say Kefka. Uh, Sephiroth is always the main villain. He's always the big bad, no matter what in this game or in this series. So having Hojo trying to turn into it, like his motivation even for wanting to destroy the world, makes no sense. At least Sephiroth, his motive, like Sephiroth's motivation is that you know he realized. You know, he realizes he was an experiment and he wants to now basically like, you know, 
he realizes he was injected with the Genova cell, so he kind of thinks he's part of Genova. All, all that other shit. I, I, I'm butchering the the story. I, I was about Donald's to say, I, I, I could tell you exactly what was going on with Sephiroth. Oh, he go was for doing, it. He was doing what Genova does. He was yes. carrying out, he was finishing what Genova actually does, yes. which Genova crashes into a planet, absorbs the life stream, and then moves on to the next planet. And because he has the Genova cells, he's genetically programmed to do that. He thinks he's acting on his own will, and obviously, like he's insane and, and all that. It's really just Genova, it's just the genetic programming that, like, that's what Genova does. Genova's supposed to show up, suck up the life force, and then move to the next planet. So that, mm-hmm. yeah, that, that's why Sephiroth does what he does. No, that Hojo's makes, just that, an asshole. Exactly. And like Kefka works as a, as a, as a chaotic villain because the entire time that you see Kefka in final six, before you find out Kefka's the villain, he's doing crazy shit for no reason. Like there's no rhyme or reason to his villainy. He just is. And like Hojo, there's, there's, actually like a reason for it like he's he's a scientist that's just curious about the world and he he's like he is a mad scientist he's like i don't care who i have to hurt if as long as i can learn he's that type of character and kefka works as the chaotic villain because you don't ever know kefka's motivations really like you kind of get some glimpses here and there but for the most part kefka's just a fucking maniac like there's no rhyme or reason to his his villainy and that's what makes him so compelling because you don't understand him that's what makes him scary he's the joker yeah he's the joker hojo you just you don't understand like almost it's weird to call a villain it's weird to say a villain having a heel turn but it kind of is like that sort of in this where like yeah there there's no like the kef or hojo in final seven would not want to do the things that hojo in this game does and i think that's why it doesn't work for me and why it rings so tone deaf because when he like comes back like a, a a digital manifestation of himself comes back and hacks into somebody else and takes over his body and then you see full cutscenes of hojo just maniacally laughing with really like uncanny valley-esque animation for the how big his mouth gets it makes me very uncomfortable to watch uh, it's just it's a weird it's a weird choice. I, I think I think it was one of those things that they f- felt that Hojo was a better selection to try and bring him back in some way and make him the arch villain because of his history and his connection with Vincent. And like he turned Vincent into a monster and all that. So they're like, well, we have to pay that off by bringing him back so him and Vincent can fight, even though they he dies in final fantasy seven of like, like very clearly, like he is dead. Uh, You defeat him as the party, which again, I think if you had Vincent in your party, they could have just thrown in like a little bit of, you know, post post boss fight dialogue or something of him saying, you know, Lucrezia, this is for you. I I don't know. Um, Also, I just wanted to put this out there because I didn't want to forget to say it. Uh, do you remember Vincent's father's name? Because it is amazing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> fuck. I, I it was even so like, good. they were, they were talking about it in the interview that I was reading. And one of the things that was funny, hold on, where was it? It was, the question was, this is about Vincent's mantle. It seems that, that it's the same mantle that is seen in grimoire on grim grimoire. How do you pronounce that? Grimoire, yeah. Grimoire. Grimoire Valentine. That's his it's father's so name. God. It's such a fuck. Oh my God. Like, it's anime junk food, man. Because I, I, I think that's why, like, the story's batshit crazy, but there's just some aspects of it where you're just like, fuck it. We ball. Like, what? what's next? Like, what crazy bullshit are we doing next? Because it's just like, Grimoire Valentine. It's like, damn. <laughs> The, they they went in on my man's name um and then you get like the like the proto materia and and just oh my god like it, it's it's a it's incredible <laughs> like how ridiculous they go because 
like we said, you, you Shulk the Transparent, you know, Nero the Sable, Weiss the Immaculate, and everybody has crazy nicknames, and they're all like super cool anime villain designs. It's just, God, this game is so wild. It's so wild. There, There's just... Uh... The, well, <laughs> I don't even know where to go, dude. Like, that, it, like I'm watching a scene right now, and I'm not gonna even going to uh, give any context in it. Yuffie was sucked into a dark zone by the kind of like who before you find out that Vice is being controlled by Hojo, his his younger brother, uh, which uh, his name's also escaping me right now. Uh, uh, Nero. Yeah. Nero, yes, yeah, Nero. Brother, yeah. Which Nero is a dude in a fucking straight jacket that yes, has wings that also has hands on the edges of the wings so he can shoot pistols while he's tied up in a straight jacket. Yes, he does. <laughs> you heard that right, folks. You're who you think is like the 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 big bad next to like you hear Vice the whole time, but Nero, the guy that you see a lot, is like your angsty emo wet dream that you always wanted uh all in black in like wrapped up in black bandit his face is covered in bandages he's wearing like a skin tight suit that also like he ties himself up in and then he's got these metal wings attached to his back that also have pistols like where like when he unfurls the wings uh there's pistol there's like little hands like you can even see like when you see close up shots they're like curled in on themselves and they unfurl and he holds pistols and he just shoots you with pistols it's fucking insane like it is the most nemora ass design you'll ever see and i think that's why you know that's what i said the the tagline this game it feels like a nemora wet dream like this is like w- i i swear to god i thought this is what he would have done to kingdom hearts or to uh, you know, remake uh, the Final Fantasy VII remake slash rebirth, but in a bizarre sense, both of those games and series are so much more tame than the shit in this game. It's so funny because, like you said, wait, Nomura didn't direct this game because it is it does hit like Kingdom Hearts level of absurd of absurdity in in parts. Uh, Nero is the prime example of that where he'll like absorb the deep ground soldiers into his darkness and shit. And it's like, wait, what? Like, what does that even mean? It's oh, my <laughs> gosh. You fight in like when you fight Nero and he takes you into like uh, when you do eventually end up fighting Nero and he takes you into like this alternate force. You fight Arachnero. He turns into a giant metal spider straight out of like fucking Wild West. And you're <laughs> That's what I thought. I was like, the fucking spider for what? <laughs> he's hanging upside down on top of a floating asteroid and he falls into lava, but that's not enough just yet. He's still kicking around and he's hopping. Uh, this game is just anime junk food. Like anime junk food make you, I can't, you nailed it from the get-go it is anime junk food even like the final cutscene like bef- like you know i think they even have to end up like turning on all the mako reactors at some point in this i'm i'm blanking on this like there's a whole bunch of crazy shit that happens but to there's a moment where lucrezia like there's so many flashbacks at the end of this game between lucrezia Ho- and hojo lucrezia and vincent and it once again, to tie it back to Metal Gear Solid, it's Metal Gear Solid levels of cutscenes. There is, I was playing the game. I'm like, oh my god, because I remember I was like close to beating it, and I'm like, I just want to go to bed, but I, I think I'm close, and I'm glad I I stopped and went to bed because when I came back, there was still an hour and like 40 minutes of it was cutscenes. Yep, yep. Oh, so uh, I I forgot. Uh, and I would be remiss to mention this. Both Nero and or Nero and Weiss are in Crisis Core. Are they? Mm hmm. They are. Well, that can lead us to the final reveal of the story, because basically uh, the, the the this is the thing that most people absolutely hate more than anything about this game. And I've never understood it. Basically, uh you once you find out that omega is uh, or or vice is being controlled by hojo hojo wants to merge with omega so that way he can take all the life stream to another planet and you you do end up taking out hojo but then because of all the shit like nero 
even though we defeated Nero earlier, he kills Hojo and then merges with Vice and they turn into Omega. And then you have to fight Omega and that's the final boss because if you don't fight Omega, the whole planet's going to die. Once you defeat Omega, you can see Vincent like a week later uh, visiting Lucrezia's tomb and you find out that both Chaos and Omega have returned to the planet thanks for... Uh, and thanks Lucrezia for, and he thanks Lucrezia for being the reason he ended up surviving. He, and he sees Shulk and everyone's waiting for him. And in the secret ending, which is what we're talking about, uh, G, a legendary warrior with unsplained, unexplained connections to deep ground, awakes beneath the ruins of Midgar and he finds Vice's body and picks it up, telling him it's not time yet for slumber. We still have much work to do, my brother. And then he sprouts large black wings and flies into the night, carrying Vice with him. Crisis Core Ultimania explains that G, Genesis, returned from his three years slumber to protect the planet. Yep. Genesis from Crisis Core. Yeah, gacked. <laughs> He's back again, baby. He's back, baby. You can't get rid of Gacked that easily. Uh, yeah, for some reason, people really hate that. I don't know why. Uh, it doesn't really bother me because I'm like, eh, whatever. Um, I get it. Gacked was a friggin' huge deal in Japan at the time. But, um, and, and, you know, again, they wanted to tie it to Crisis Core, and Genesis is a bigger deal in Crisis Core, and connections to Sephiroth and Zach. I fucking hate Genesis and, and Crisis Core. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you know, he's kind of like a little punk ass because you just beat him down like it ain't nothing. But um, so, you know, that that's I get it <laughs> like, you know, the, I get the connection and the desire to have the connection. Um, oh, the, by the way, the restrictors, uh, that was a guy that was the restrictor. He was a part of soldier uh, who was the original leader of Deep Ground and implanted like uh, microchips into all the members of Deep Ground so that they couldn't attack him. But somehow he was defeated and but he infected Weiss or whatever. Nanomachines. Yeah. Do you know, and speaking of other things that are a little confusing about the plot, uh, the WRO, you know, Reeve running this this organization to help heal the planet and everything, and they have to fight deep ground and all that shit. He has a secret benefactor who's providing all the money for everything. He's the reason why you end up being able to fly on the high wind at one point, which is a pretty cool moment of the game. I think visually it's yeah. really pretty. And you get to see Sid and a bunch of the other characters from Final 7, and that's really cool. But who who is... Who's the benefactor? Do you know? I don't think they ever explicitly say it, but I think it's supposed to be Rufus Shinra. Isn't Rufus dead? No, he's not dead. I he was he thought died. to be dead because you you realize in you know in Advent Children, which I think takes place. Oh two years yeah, after this? yeah, yeah, yeah. It I think Advent after. Children takes yeah. It takes place like two years after because I think it's five years after seven. Um, Rufus is alive. So I think he's like in hiding or whatever. But yeah, I, I if I remember correctly, it's like insinuated that Rufus is the benefactor, but they don't ever explicitly say that it, it's Rufus. But yeah, I'm I'm almost positive that he's supposed to be the one cuz you know, he pretends to have the um the geostigma virus in Advent Children and you know when he's got like and he's supposed to be oh, I'm all scarred up and messed up, but then it turns out he's he's not he was just lying <laughs> he's fine i haven't seen advent children in probably 15 years i need uh, it's got an amazing in fight in it um other than that it's kind of boring <laughs> i re that's what i remember i remember I, I i liked it more from its because the visuals were so pretty i'm like look it's, it's final beautiful. fantasy and it, like it hit me that's a good example of like something that does not hold up even though i was obsessed with at the time when i first saw it um yeah with with advent children the first I'll, I'll i've told this story before i think and I'll, I'll tell it again here and when i eventually cover the movie on on the podcast at some point the first time i ever watched oh, advent children amazing. what sorry I'm very excited for when you cover it because uh, I I remember how I watched it for the first time and thought it was the most amazing, incredible thing ever. But again, I was like deep into the Final Fantasy VII. Yeah, uh, that that was when I was like very, very, very much into it. Um, 
so I, I can relate to that a lot. But when I first saw it, they didn't, it wasn't released in North America yet, or like at least not easily accessible. Yeah. Uh, and I remember being in my friend downloaded an illegal cop. I mean, a totally legal copy of it. Yeah, of course. Um, and just to date this, just to date me and how old I am, uh, he had an iPod video. And that was like the new hotness at the time. Like your iPod can play videos. I watched it in study hall on an iPod video. Oh, man. That's that's was it in English or was it in uh, Japanese? I think it was with subtitles. And I was like, I just popped headphones on and I just like fucking blocked out the world and I watched it the whole way through. I think I had to do it in two study hall sessions because it's like an hour and 40 minutes and we did have block scheduling so i might have actually had enough time no because i think period i think how many how long were classes in block scheduling because i think normally if 90 you have minutes. Eight periods what sorry uh it was 90 minutes when we did uh blocks block scheduling that makes the most sense yeah because it was normally 45 minutes for a period and then you would have eight periods throughout the day uh, so it'd be 90 minutes for block scheduling. Yeah, I did block scheduling. And so I don't think I was able to finish it all in one um, or something like that. But I remember watching the whole thing over the course of like two different study hall periods or something like that. And I was like, what is this? This is amazing. Yeah, I I, I had a, a similar thing. A guy in, I took my, was it my senior year? Yes, my senior year of high school, I took an animation class uh, and a guy in my animation class gave me a, a totally legally obtained copy uh, on a disc that he definitely didn't burn. Um, and it was uh, it was Japanese with subtitles. And I went and watched that on my computer and I made my girlfriend at the time watch it. Uh, and I felt like that that meme from the Jeffrey Dahmer like Netflix show with Evan Peters where I'm like standing at my computer and I'm like, we're going to watch this because it's really important and it's really good. <laughs> yeah, and she did not care at all. Uh, you know, we broke up. I don't want to say it's because she disrespected <laughs> Advent children, but um, it's because she disrespected Advent children. Uh, but yeah, like I watched it. I was like, this is the most amazing thing ever. This is awesome. And then like I've sent, watched it since then. And I'm just like, this is boring <laughs> for the most of the damn movie. Nothing happens. It's just people talking about nonsense and like Cloud just being a little sad boy the whole time. Uh, and then Sephiroth shows up and nice to see you cloud and it's amazing and then after that it's all you need is that end fight i will never be a memory and then he is because he lost <laughs> but it was awesome anyway love advent children it's like well, this game <laughs> i mean it, it definitely influenced this game obviously a lot of theming and everything but yeah we'll, we'll have to save all that talk of advent children for an, uh, an advent children episode but yeah. mick i think we got to wrap up this episode we're coming up on the two hour mark which i'm not surprised i was expecting this uh, i'm sure other people may be surprised that we could spend two hours talking about dirge of cerberus but this game uh it's something um, I, I think we should go into our final thoughts. So I, I'll, I'll give you, I'll, since you are the guest, you will get the final word. Uh, right. We can leave the listeners with that because I think also you will be a little bit more positive than me. Um, <laughs> ah, maybe. I think that this game is a misfire in a lot of different ways. It's not a hundred percent bad. Like I'm not going to say that I, I'm not going to sit here and be like this game. I, I can't believe I wasted my time with this. I, I also don't re I can't really say that I enjoyed my time with it. Uh, I think the gameplay is really boring. I think it's a little bit too repetitive as much as there is a deep amount of customization with your weapons. It really doesn't do enough like variation to make it feel all that different. Like I genuinely could barely tell the difference between the weapons. The only way I could tell the difference between the weapons is that between the fire fire rate and the um, 
and and the damage and you would think oh is that shouldn't that all there be all there is to it but like i'll play tons of F- fps's and even like there'll be different like automatic weapons that have a completely different feel because like the way that it's programmed like the, there's just not enough variety i guess in terms of both the enemy types in terms of the weapons which is frustrating because there's a lot of deep mechanics with the leveling up system and there's this branching skill paths but i just don't think there's enough like the the branching paths don't offer enough variation to make it all that interesting in my opinion and then you have the one random kate sith section which just was out of the blue and then the bosses are too easy and that you combine that with one of the worst stories i've ever experienced in my life um the only thing i can say about it that like is more than like more complimentary than it, like gameplay i'm at very least neutral on story i'm obviously on negative on the visuals and the overall presentation even with the the, the bad voice acting uh once again i don't blame the voice actors like we were like we gushed about absolutely stellar cast I just think that like the the visuals are fantastic and like the the music is good and the voice performances do their job. It kind of actually fits in with the cheesy story, so it it, it doesn't it's not quite as jarring as you would expect it to be. So that's really the only complimentary thing I can say is just the overall aesthetic is really good. I really enjoyed the world they built and the visuals and how Vincent looks and the enemies look, but everything else, man, it just felt like a misfire. Pun kind of intended, I guess. Um it just i don't know i i don't think i would really recommend people to play this it doesn't even fit in with final fantasy lore anymore cuz they they've revamped so much of it and they like it just kind of shows like this game kind of died oh fun fact i forgot to bring up um there was multiplayer in this game but not in north america or europe and it was only it only came out in japan and the reason they scrapped it for the north american and european releases because no one in North America or Europe really gave a shit about online multiplayer on PlayStation at the time, especially when you have Xbox 360, if you think about it, because this came out in what, 2006, right? Um, yeah, yeah. That like the 360 was already cooking for about two years at that point. So online multiplayer was starting to take off for that. And what's even more wild is in the interview that I was reading, there's plot, there's, there's like, story content and plot points in the multiplayer like you oh yeah that's where like the stuff with uh the restrictor is 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 in the multiplayer it the restrictor also more about shelk's backstory is in is in the multiplayer i'm like why would you do that why would you not even include that like you you have a whole section about the 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 stories of the characters and you scrubbed it from the North American release. So now Americans literally was missing or were missing a bunch of like story content. Admittedly, the story isn't good. So I don't know if it would have made it better. I already think they over explained things too much. And trust me, I understand. I, I know all too well over explaining that is my MO. So <laughs> it, I don't know. I just overall this game, I didn't hate it but i also would not say i enjoyed my time with it so i it, it's kind of like uh if i'm going on a scale of one to ten i don't like to do that all the time i'd give it a four that which makes it sound much worse like i'm not talking about an ign 10 like if 10 is like best game i've ever played one is worst game i've ever played five is like neutral i don't have any strong positive or strong negative feelings with it i'd give it actually like a four and a half it's just it's slightly it's like neutral with a little bit of a tinge of negative negativity in it and that's what i would give this game well said (laughs) so so Um, mick over to you i I know i i pretty i was pretty harsh on it don't feel the need to to either i don't know i'm not going to try to influence you one or the other you give your honest take on it what are your thoughts on this game overall um you know it's very much a time capsule game i think when it came out uh it, it's it's what i wanted in a game it's what i wanted in a you know in a final fantasy 7 i don't really want to call it like a sequel because it it's not in the sense it's not continuing the story from seven really it's continuing vincent's story uh and for me that you know i i think that's what everybody wanted you know it's you know advent children came out we just we wanted more like everybody loved seven so much that we just wanted more of that world and that universe and those characters and you know they wrapped wrapped it up 
So we're kind of like, you know, and I, I, what the next year we got like the tech demo that showed um, the train sequence from seven done on like PlayStation three graphics. So everybody got so excited because like, oh, my God, we're getting a remake. We did just like 25 years later. Um, <laughs> no big deal. Uh, so like when it came out, it's what I wanted. Um it was a cool character. It looked good. Uh, the gameplay was was fun because of like the gun sequences. Getting to use the limit breaks to transform uh, that was really cool. Oh, yeah, I, I like, forgot. We I forgot to bring that up. Yeah, we 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 forgot. I never even used earlier. it. <laughs> oh yeah, I used it all the time because like to me that was like the the fun part. Uh, I I will say I wasn't a super big fan of how Vincent looked in his chaos form um because you know he doesn't look anything like that in in seven he just looks like a big giant demon dude and this it's very like it's very trinity blood if you've ever seen that anime it's very it's very that um which is i think that was an anime that was like hitting around that time that was uh, a little more popular and it was vampires and and all that kind of stuff so like when it came out everything i wanted uh from from the game um it's it was fun. It was relatively short, uh, you know, compared to something like seven. So you mm -hmm. could play it multiple times and play levels over and over again with like different combinations and stuff like that. If you wanted to, you could. Uh, as I got older and I went back and played it again, looking for that initial like, oh, it was so amazing. It's like watching Advent Children the first time. It was this amazing thing. It was awesome. We loved it. But as you go back to it, you're just like, Oh, wow. Objectively, this is just kind of mediocre. <laughs> um, looks good, but everything else is not great. Uh, and, and that's kind of how I feel about it. Like, it's fun. I would encourage people not like go out right now, buy a PlayStation 2, buy an old television. I'm not saying that, but it's one of those things. Should you have an easy opportunity to try it? I think you'd have fun to play like a level or two. But I by no means am like, yes, play the whole game because it's awesome. And it's no, not at all. Um, watching like a playthrough on YouTube, I think would probably suffice. Um, <laughs> but I think I think mechanically it, it's fun to play a couple of levels for sure, especially if you like, um, you know, kind of like action shooter games. You know, it, it it's not as good as uh, Devil May Cry in terms of gameplay, but if you like games like Devil May Cry or Near Automata, uh, it has similarities to those. Like the the you can see sort of uh, the touches of games like Devil May Cry in it um, because you know, hey man, God of War changed the game. So did Devil May Cry. Like that really changed what action games needed to be, and they had an interesting take with this. Uh, I don't want to say it was a swing and a miss because I appreciate that they tried, but in classic kind of Square Enix fashion, it didn't explode and be like the biggest thing ever. So they're like, we're never doing that shit again. So that is sort of the downside <laughs> of like, I'm, I'm sure there's other games out there that I'd like to see them try things with and they just won't because, well, Dirge of Cerebus does that. Final Fantasy XII Revenant Wings does that. <laughs> you know, these then where they're like, we're going to give people the sequel that they want. And then it doesn't sell like, you know, 10 million copies. And they say, we're never doing this again. Um, I would be intrigued maybe to see what kind of like a remaster would look like. You know, if they cleaned it up a little bit, maybe fixed some story beats up a, a touch. Um they have incorporated other char uh, characters from the game. Nero is in um, Yuffie's story for remake. He's actually what? In mm hmm. Yep. Uh. Uh, it's a smaller role, but he's still in it. And of course, like it sets up for, you know, his role in Dirge of Cerberus. But yeah, he's he is in it. He is in uh, Yuffie's part of remake. Because, hey underground clandestine blacklist uh scarlet sends him to uh kill yuffie which would make sense that scarlet would know about deep ground and everything so yeah uh i i would i would probably rate this about a six 
on on your scale. I, I think it's about a six because I, I have enough like positive memories of it that I go, yeah, this is good. I do think had I not played it when it came out and like was excited and pre-ordered and ran and got it and all that kind of stuff, I, I probably wouldn't feel the same. I could definitely acknowledge that based on like the gameplay and the story because the story is just bananas and not in like a good way because yeah. again just it's like try and simply explain the story of final fantasy 7 dirge of cerebrus to someone you can't do it because there's there's so much like there's so many weird things that you have to put in there that it just very quickly doesn't make sense um and it's not even like well vincent has to save the world because that's not quite what he's doing it's not like he doesn't even know that the world's like under threat at first yeah <laughs> that's like the whole thing is like it, it, it that's in essentially the final boss fight he figures that out but um yeah i i give it a six i i do think it's it's fun it's a neat part of uh final fantasy 7 history and lore like you said some things have been kind of erased uh some things still very much live on so it makes me wonder are we going to get the remaster? if we get the remaster i'll buy it day one no question asked. <laughs> I'll I'll purchase it. Although I would love if they would just give us Final Fantasy Tactics, please, for the love of God, give us Final Fantasy Tactics remastered. Seriously, man, I need to. Act- I've tried playing Tactics, and I, I got actually really far. I got stuck on a fight, and I. Anyway, that's a that's a different story. Um, no, I I I, I can understand. I, I think I can I can agree with you, Dick. And I, I also will say, at least with this, I I actually don't. I, I'm happy they made this game. Like it's I I really didn't like it, but I also am. It's one of those games where I'm happy it still exists. Like there are very few games that I can point to. Excuse me, where I'm like I wish that piece of shit never existed. Like I I'm trying to even think of one off the. I'm sure there's this one that I can probably think of. Like if someone made like a horribly racist game, or I, I know there's games out there that have done shit like that. And because people think they're funny or I don't want, I don't fucking know people are dumb. Um, so I'm sure there's some out there, but there are very few games that I can think of where I'm just like, yeah, why did they, why would they waste their time making this? There's a very, I can't, I'd have to actually think about it. Like I, I would actually have to put some thought into it. I can't just pick one off the top of my head. And this is definitely not, would not be included on that. Like I, I had enough enjoyment and I, I, I think this game is fun enough that I'm happy. I'm happy it exists. Just not necessarily happy. I spent time with it, but no, that that's no, I, I totally get that. Like I said, I, I, I think if someone was just curious, like I said, play a couple levels, you know, I, I think that will give you probably will scratch whatever kind of itch that you would have for experiencing the game. Uh, maybe even do like one boss fight, like do like the first boss fight and be like, okay, cool. And then you could put it down and and you're good. Like I said, watch like the story sequences on a YouTube video or something like that. That That's what I would largely recommend is like, if you're really, really curious, play a couple levels because that's probably all you're, you're, you need. I think you'd be good on that. But I, I, I by no means tell people, yes, run out, go play this game again, unless for the purposes of a podcast, it makes perfect sense because there's just so much fun nonsense that you get to discuss. Um, but for, you know, just like if you want a game to enjoy, go play Final Fantasy seven instead. That would be my suggestion. Or Crisis Core. That is a way better game. Crisis Core is a lot. Even even though that story is kind of crazy, um, it, it is it is uh, a much 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 better game but yeah i think i think that'll do it for this episode man thank you thank you for joining me on this one this was a really fun conversation about crisis core i, I not crisis core oh my gosh dirge of cerberus <laughs> fi- dirge of cerberus final fantasy 7 uh I, I i enjoyed this i i was uh not sure what i would have to say about it but like once we got going into it it was like oh man now i'm remembering all everything that happened just a month ago and it's it's it, it, it was a good time. Thank you. So thank you for joining me, man. Uh, where can the good people find you online and what would you like to promote? Oh, uh, well, I'm on the internet pretty much everywhere at uh, Mick Arcade uh, on Instagram. I'm that Mick Arcade. That's where I'm the most active is on Instagram. It's mostly just pictures of my kid and me doing jujitsu. But uh, hey, I do stuff there. Uh, I also voice act. Uh, I am a professional voice actor. Um, uh, you can... 
hear me in various places. Uh, I'm, I'm regularly heard on uh, Doorway uh, to Nightmare. Uh, I, it's a horror mystery um, focused uh, podcast. I do a ton of of voices uh basically every psychopath and every old man you hear in any of those stories is more than likely me i I, I specialize in psychopaths and crazy and and not i mean not just crazy old men but old men um every old man i seem to get that role for some reason i i don't know why um but yeah i'm always looking for more work so if you would like to have me voice something for you hey shoot me a message and i I, i'll probably say yeah (laughs) because <laughs> I, I just like doing it. Um, I also, uh, right now, I don't have anything, but I got stuff coming in the pipeline, and it's just my my friends and everything. Uh, if you like Dungeons & Dragons, um, Playotic Games on Twitch is uh, my D&D troupe, and we do a lot of really cool, fun stuff. Uh, we raise a lot of fun money for charity. Uh, we go to conventions and do stuff. Uh, we just did one over the summer that was a blast. Um, and yeah check check us out we do a lot of really cool stuff and there's a lot of really great talented people in the troop and yeah so if you if you dig dungeons and dragons that is a thing that you should check out for sure and that's about all i got working on right now i got a few projects that i'm i'm cooking on but i don't even want to talk about it because it's like i don't know when they're going to be done so i don't want to be like oh here's this thing and then like a year from now it's done you know what i mean I gotcha. I gotcha. I gotcha. Um, yeah. So everyone, please go follow Mick at all those locations, you know, all social media and look out for all the work that he can't talk about yet. Uh, <laughs> so looking forward to that. And, you know, maybe keep an eye on the play out games for someone. You never know who might show up. there. Hey, at point. Yeah. All sorts um, of people can show up. But uh, anyway, for myself, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, threads, blue sky, Instagram, twitch at still loading pod all those different uh, at all those different locations at still loading podcast over on youtube you can support the show by giving it a five-star rating or review that really honestly helps the show the most it doesn't cost you anything just a little bit of your time and it, it helps more people find the show um and it would mean a lot to me so please consider doing that if you if you want to support the show that way there's a way to support it monetarily as well over at patreon.com slash still pod for a dollar a month you get all the episodes a little bit earlier with better audio quality along with patron voting rights which helped pick this episode once again backlog month at the beginning of every year i i post a poll like hey here's like 16 games help me pick four of them and i actually have to start coming up with my list of 16 for for next year soon i think um so help pick backlog month like what you just heard the last four episodes um so if you want to make your voice heard you can there's quarterly polls and there's the backlog month poll which happens in the beginning of the year in january so please consider going over there that's all for only a dollar a month for three dollars a month you get everything i mentioned prior plus patron shout outs which you heard at the beginning of this episode for four dollars a month you get everything i mentioned prior plus two mini bonus episodes every single month and for five dollars a month you get Everything I mentioned prior, plus access to my monthly movie podcast, which when this is slated to come out, it is in a transitionary period. Uh, the most recent series was Still Bonding, which Mick has was on for GoldenEye. It was and so fun. It was my month. It's my that was a monthly movie uh, James Bond podcast where, we, where me and a bunch of friends bond over 007. What will be starting next month in just a few weeks in November, though I haven't picked a guest out for that yet. I got to start working on that. Um, assuming everything, I have some stuff happening behind the scenes on in my personal life. Assuming that doesn't interfere, we will be starting up Still Family, the monthly Fast and Furious podcast where all my guests, where all the guests who join me for that aren't just friends, they're family. Uh, oh, I love it. <laughs> so there that, that's going to be a lot of fun as well so if you like all that stuff still loading patreon.com slash still loading pod there's lots of good stuff coming out over there and yeah that will do it y'all that's the end of this episode that is the end of backlog month thank you all once again for joining me for this episode and for backlog month mick thank you for joining me for this episode thank you for having me it's a pleasure as always and with all that said listeners i will see you all next time